And joining us now, Christine Linz. She is the Secretary General of the European Renewable Energy Council. And we welcome you here to the province of Ontario, to Canada. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. We're nice gonna, to meet you. We're going to do this interview in your second or third language, I guess, right? Yes, sir. German, French, English, Italian, Spanish. Don't challenge me on the Spanish. I'm not that fluent. We'll, we'll avoid the Spanish. <laughs> we'll stick to English. You're here, obviously, to help uh, Greenpeace promote its Canada Energy Revolution report that wants to see uh, carbon emissions reduced to 45% uh, below 1990 levels by the year 2020. We are currently more than 20% above 1990 levels. So my first question is, how realistic is it to get from there to where we've got to go? Well, uh, according to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, industrialized countries need to uh, reduce uh, CO2 emissions uh, between 25 and 40 percent by 2020 from 1990 levels. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, the challenge, the global, uh, the, the climate challenge we have ahead of us, uh, we have faced uh, the consequences in, in the previous years. So uh, I think it is getting more and more common ground that we need to do something. And this uh, joint study, uh, the uh, Energy Revolution, which is a global study, uh, which we then broke down into different uh, studies for continents and countries, so as uh, Canada, just uh, shows a pathway on how we managed to, uh, to reach uh, these uh, significant CO2 emissions that are necessary to avoid uh, disastrous uh, no, challenges of climate change. I want to figure out, though, how easy it's going to be or... or some might say how impossible it's going to be to get down that pathway. Among the recommendations, the report calls for a cap-and-trade system or a carbon tax to encourage CO2 reduction. Now, we went through a big election campaign in this country last year, and carbon tax went right into the toilet. The party that was recommending that had one of its worst showings ever. Uh, but not everybody knows what cap-and-trade is, so let's look at that. Tell us what a cap-and-trade system is. Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, the, uh, the uh, polluters, uh, they uh, need to uh, buy uh, certificates to, for their emissions, and those are then traded, and these funds are then used uh, to, to promote other projects. But basically, the energy revolution is not only uh, advocating a, a cap-and-trade policy. Uh, it, it says, above all, uh, that uh, we need to uh, get it right on the energy efficiency side. We need to reduce energy consumption as much as we can by uh, putting in place uh, mandatory standards for appliances, for vehicles, and uh, for, uh, for, 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 for buildings. And then in the second step, we need to generate as much as possible with renewable energy sources. Canada does have an inherent uh, potential, significant potential, apart from hydro in the field of wind, uh, geothermal, solar, uh, biomass, uh, just to name a few. We need to change our uh, energy infrastructure, getting away from uh, centralized energy generation to more and more uh, decentralized. And then uh, at the end of the day, we also, uh, or in addition to this, we also uh, need to focus on energy efficient vehicles. So just getting our transport uh, more, more efficient, basically. Okay, well that, that's a long list. We're going to get to some of those as we go along. But there's one more on the list that we haven't talked about. And that is the report saying that we need to provide defined and stable returns for investors, for example, by feed-in tariff programs. I haven't heard of that one before. What's a feed-in tariff program? Uh, well, a feed-in tariff is, uh, is basically uh, a stable framework. Uh, a generator of uh, renewable energy electricity uh, knows how, uh, to, under which condition he can uh, feed in this uh, electricity, the generated electricity into the grid, how much he gets. Uh, there are different systems in place. For example, uh, Germany has put in place uh, the, uh, a feed-in tariff. This policy, Germany was the first country to, to do this. Uh, this policy was copied now uh, by 73 countries all over the world. It was, it's really the most successful policy for promoting uh, renewables. And then uh, this, uh, basically what happens is that uh, the operator of the renewable plant knows uh, with which uh, price to calculate over a period of 15 to 20 years. So basically he can calculate the return on investment and uh, that, that brings uh, money into the, into the market, basically. Does it force people to buy power at well above market rates? Uh, well, the, um, uh, the German system is effectively the most, ex uh, the most uh, successful system uh, we have seen so far for uh, generating uh, renewable electricity. Uh, the costs uh, of, the, uh, of the German feed-in uh, price is not uh, borne by the state, but by all the consumers uh, in, in, the, in the form of a levy. Uh, but uh, what we talk about uh, a, a price uh, of about three uh, euros per household and month, 
which is equivalent uh, to Germans like to drink beer, as the Canadians I have learned here. <laughs> uh, so about one beer per household uh, is the price what it costs uh, for, uh, for, for a consumer uh, to, to have quite a significant amount of, uh, of renewable electricity in the country. And this comes uh, also with quite a significant share of renewables industry. Uh, today, Germany is really the uh, leading country when it comes to uh, to renewables mm -hmm. uh, industry uh, companies. But, but it's essentially, I think I've got this right. Essentially, you're you're forcing people to buy power from this renewable situation above market rates, and in some respects, that kind of hides the cost of what it actually costs to produce this energy. Isn't that right? Well, uh, that uh, we, we come to the point that uh, in, in in today's energy prices. Uh, we don't really have the, uh, a, very, uh, a very transparent picture because uh, still nowadays conventional fuels are, are heavily subsidized and uh, in most cases, for example, uh, insurance for nuclear power plants uh, is not covered uh, by the utilities but is covered by the state. So these are kind of hidden subsidies and um, we are just uh, advocating that uh, for, uh, sub uh, subsidies for, fossil and con for conventional fuels, fossil fuels and, and nuclear should be phased out. And then uh, if we have a true competition in, on market prices, then renewables won't actually need uh, these uh, feed-in uh, uh, tariff systems uh, to compete uh, with. But right now, it, it's just necessary so it's, to... it's not to, a fair to, fight right now. Exactly, to, to distort. Okay. It's, it's quite a distorted picture right at the moment. Understood. Uh, let's take a look at the European model and see if this does set an example for Canada here. And we're going to bring these numbers up here. We're taking a look at greenhouse gas trends from the year 1990 to the year 2006. That's the year for which most recent figures are available. Canada is 22 percent above where we were in 1990. The EU 15, as they're called, the westernmost, I guess, most developed nations in the European Union, are actually 0.9 percent below where you were in 1990. Now, which kind of renewable energy technology has helped Europe the most in reducing its greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I think uh the, basically, uh, when we talk about renewables, we always talk about uh, a mix of, uh, of different sources. But very clearly, the most uh, successful technology uh, which has taken off so far is, uh, is wind energy. So uh, there was lots of things uh, happening. We have, for example, uh, in, uh, in, in Germany alone, uh, now about uh, 25,000 megawatts of uh, wind installed. Uh, we are proposing uh, in, in our energy revolution uh, scenario as a wind energy target for Canada, um, the, uh, uh, a similar amount uh, for 2040. And this, uh, this amount was installed uh, in Germany in the last 10 years. So uh, you see that uh, our, our, our figures, or the proposals we are making in the energy revolution are absolutely uh, realistic and achievable. Okay, but w would they be realistic and achievable if not for the fact that France is so overwhelmingly nuclear and that's what helps you get to the reductions that we've talked about here? Uh, well, um, I think what uh, we we managed to uh, what managed to take off uh, wind in Germany is a, a clear uh, government policy. The, the government has clearly put the framework in place, and with this framework, so uh, it, it actively uh, pr promoted renewable energy sources. And with this uh, framework, it actually uh, helped to create an industry which uh, today is employing uh, in Germany alone 250,000 people. I appreciate that, Chris. That's all true, but you couldn't get there without the nukes, could you? Well, uh, basically what we are uh, discussing right now uh, in Europe is a, a binding 20% renewable energy target by 2020. Uh, so, of course, in the European energy mix, uh, we do have nuclear, we do have coal, we do have fossil fuels. Uh, but we are just seeing that uh, the renewables are the ones progressing over time. And uh, it is very difficult nowadays uh, to build additional uh, nuclear power plants uh, in the European Union. We have one case, one plant, which is currently built in Finland but they just encounter enormous delays and enormous increase of costs. And, uh, and then also we have something uh, we just see that uh, in Europe, acceptance of the population for renewables is much higher than it is for additional uh, nuclear or, or, or coal power plants. Well, we're about to go gung-ho into nuclear power here. The province of Ontario has said it's going to spend tens of billions of dollars building new nuclear facilities here in the hopes that those will be cleaner, obviously, than the coal-fired generating stations. Do you, not do you not approve of that approach? Well, I think the, the government of Ontario has also uh, uh, agreed on what is called the Green Energy Act, if I'm oh, yes, uh, that's correctly true informed. Too. So uh, they have also uh, put in place, or th they said they will put in place a framework for promoting renewables. That's all true, too. And, uh, you and don't want to give any, you, but uh, you don't want to give nuclear its day, though, do you? And there are a lot of people who are coming around to believing that nuclear 
is an essential part of cleaning up the skies. Uh, well, uh, we, we are just demonstrating with our uh, energy revolution scenario that it can be done, uh, that we can reach our uh, CO2 uh, reduction targets uh, with uh, an increase in the energy efficiency and increase in renewables with a, phasing, with a parallel phasing out of nuclear and uh, of coal over a period from now to 2050. So effectively, it's not, it's not going to be possible uh, tomorrow, but uh, if eventually. you have effectively, eventually, exactly, if you have effectively aging capacity, capacity uh, that will have to be phased out, then I think it's going to be the tipping point uh, where it will be feasible whether the government is serious with its commitment to green energy or whether it will uh, again continue uh, to, to, to focus on a, on a, on a nuclear promotion okay. policy. Let me ask you about wind because I'm telling you uh, virtually every day in the newspapers and the media in this province over the last several months there have been new stories about the wind turbines that um, the projects that are being proposed for all over Ontario. And there has been a, a lot of citizen uh, outrage about they make too much noise, they disrupt people's sleeping patterns, they don't look nice, uh, we don't want them here, it's okay in non-populated areas, but we don't want them close to where people are living. How has the industry in Europe dealt with all of these concerns? Uh, well, effectively, uh, we have seen over the, over the years that projects that are promoted by uh, cooperatives uh, that involve the people, uh, that involved the farmers who own the land, uh, who then through uh, the, uh, the building up, the setting up of wind turbines, uh, generate additional income, that those projects uh, have much less problems in, in getting acceptance, in, in getting across, whereas when it's, it's big util utilities uh, developing projects, then often you have what you call uh, the NIMBY syndrome, the not in my backyard syndrome, which of course is much more uh, uh, pronounced uh, for, for nuclear or for coal-fired power plants. So there is still much less resistance uh, when it comes to wind. Uh, it is important that uh, planning procedures are transparent, that the people are involved in the process, and, uh, and most of the times uh, in projects where they actually benefit uh, from, from the setting up of a, of a wind turbine, then uh, the, uh, the negative uh, reactions to it are, are much uh, less severe. Did they you have experience much nimbyism in Europe when this took place? Well, there is, and it's, it's, the, the situation is very different uh, in the different countries. For example, in Germany, the acceptance of the population of, uh, for, for wind is much bigger than it is, for example, for France. France clearly uh, being a very uh, centralized country when it comes to energy, uh, having a large uh, nuclear industry, there uh, it is much more difficult to, uh, to, get, uh, to get wind projects off the ground. Therefore, it is important uh, to have um, effectively uh, appropriate administrative procedures, uh, planning uh, procedures, it needs to be transparent and uh, there are lots of uh, also wrong arguments uh, circulating uh, that, that wind is killing birds or uh, that offshore wind is killing fish. So uh, there are also lots of studies uh, proving that this is actually not the case. Uh, and uh, of course you need to, to put uh, the wind turbines in appropriate locations. Uh, I think uh, Canada ha having so much, such a vast territory having really lots of space where these wind turbines could effectively be placed. Hmm. Um, we saw from the earlier graphic that Europe is a lot further along the continuum than we are in reducing our CO2 emissions. But I want to find out from you whether or not you think the European model really is an example for us. Given that our winters are a lot worse than most countries in Europe, our summers are a lot hotter, um, we, it's a big country, we've got to travel a lot, uh, our gas prices are cheaper than your prices are over there, so is the European efficiency model, would it really work for Canada? Well, well I think it does. I, I think, uh, I don't want to say that uh, the European model can be transposed one to one. This is definitely not the case. I think uh, you require uh, uh, tailor-made solutions for, for any country. So we are not advocating to really replicate exactly what has been done. But I think uh, the principles of the European model in terms of um, defining uh, stable uh, policy frameworks uh, this is the kind of thing, uh, and then uh, d defining action plans on how to move along them. This is the way uh, that could be nicely applied to, to other parts of the world and to Canada as well. So uh, we have the situation that uh, we started our renewables promoting policy, I would say, back in the 90s in the European Union. We had uh, all the time indicative targets, uh, and now in 2007, the 27 heads of states have for the first time uh, got together and they have agreed on a binding uh, 20% uh, renewable energy target in final energy consumption by the year 2020. 
and this target is then translated into uh, different national targets. So each country has a different target, and those uh, will now uh, need to be uh, worked out with national action plans. So kind of uh, each country has to come up with a strategy on how they want to do in the field of electricity, heating, cooling, and uh, biofuels. Very clearly, these strategies are going to be very different because not only the climate between Europe and uh, Canada is different, but we also have uh, big differences uh, within the European countries. Uh, we need a lot of uh, heating uh, in the north, uh, and we need uh, cooling in the south. And definitely, the approach on, on how to go ahead with this is a different one in the different countries. But uh, we have just seen that stable frameworks, they, um, they uh, are able then uh, to, uh, to deliver uh, on, the, uh, uh, on, on the climate target side, on the renewables target side. And again, and I, I would like to insist on this, they really uh, promote the creation of an industry. So we have nowadays in Europe uh, about 450,000 people working in the renewables industry. Uh, we expect uh, this number to grow to about 2 million by the year 2020. So uh, we see uh, double-digit growth rates in, in all of the sectors. Uh, many of, in many sectors, the European uh, companies at the moment are, are the market leaders. They generate an annual turnover in the order of 45 billion euros uh, per year. I do appreciate all this, but uh, take, take that out of the mix and just look at cultural. Uh, th we, we have a very different culture over here than you do in Europe. Uh, a lot of people here like to dr drive bigger cars. They like to take longer road trips. They like to live in bigger houses. Is our culture just simply not set up to make this kind of transition in the way that perhaps Europeans have? No, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, it, it, I think what we need uh, for the sake of saving our climate, of saving the planet, is it uh, is a, a change in my uh, in mindset. Uh, it, 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 we need to change uh, in Europe. In Europe, not everything uh, is bright, so we also do have to make our um, our uh, improvements. And uh, I think there is lots to be done uh, also on the Canadian side to just uh, get ourselves there. And uh, the beauty about renewable energy sources is as uh, they are decentralized in, in most cases. We have been talking mainly about wind, but uh, we have left aside all other uh, technologies like solar thermal, like biomass, like geothermal energy. That, uh, and I would say the renewables are really uh, the, the energy sources of the people. And we, we just see more and more that uh, people, they want to get engaged, they, they want to uh, get committed, and, and they are really interested uh, in, uh, in seeing the, these kind of sources grow. So uh, we actually see already uh, a change in mindset. We have elections in the, uh, for the European Parliament at the beginning of June, uh, coming up now. And uh, one of the campaign uh, sujets, uh, so to say, is what kind of energy do we want? So we see that energy has really moved in the center of, uh, of public debate. There is lots of discussion going on. Uh, and uh, we just see uh, an ever-growing support for, for the renewable sector. And we thank you for coming in tonight to tell us all about it. Christine Linz, Secretary General of the European Renewable Energy Council. Thanks so much. Thank you.